Mm -hmm. All right, well, you're ready, Pip. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Um, a continuation of the Phoenix Polar Vortex, which for <laughs> anyone else. <laughs> we had people here from Chicago this weekend, and I took them to see the electric illumination, you know, at the Botanical Garden. I'm wrapped in layers, you know. I have gloves and the whole bit, and there they are, kind of like stripping off. <laughs> it was too funny. We are here to welcome Reese Bowen um, and launch her new book, uh, The Victory Garden. And for those of you who don't know it, this is the day before publication. A strategic move on our part because Michelle Obama is in town tomorrow night. And while probably, well, maybe one of you actually scored a ticket for the Camara Theater. Did anybody here do that? No. So, nonetheless, why <laughs> yeah. not right? Yeah. So, welcome, Reese. Well, thank you very much. And it's lovely. Welcome, everybody. I love seeing familiar faces, and it's really nice. Thank you. And you brought a bartender, which means that we can have oh, yes. thank a you. toast. <laughs> so, <laughs> Therese. Yeah. And the yes. Victory Garden. Yes. I'm sure there'll be more champagne after that. The, the bartender over there is still working. Before we start, I have to show you my show and tell. This is what my daughter had made for me for Christmas. Isn't that cute? Yeah, that is truly fabulous. Remind me to photograph. Yeah, we'll do it when we're done. Okay. Right. So this time, Reese, you are in a place that I haven't read about all that often in England. You decided to go to a, yeah. an interesting county. So tell us about it. Well, We've, um, you mean in time or in place? In pla this is a book that's set in World War I. As you know, I've done two standalones in World War II, and I've been fascinated with World War II because it was this time of heightened emotion of uh, good versus evil. But we were getting close to the centennial of the end of World War I, and I became very aware of what a stupid, senseless war that was. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the number of people that, that war killed more people than any other war ever. And um, it was all for nothing. It was a minor archduke who was assassinated in, uh, in the Balkans, and that produced four <coughs> years of conflict which absolutely decimated Europe. So, you know, I was very conscious of that, and I thought, you know, I really want to, I really want to write about this. And it, it hasn't been written about as much. And also I set it in Devonshire, which is a place that's very close to my heart, um, my father's family comes from Devonshire, from Crediton, and um, so that was nice. And it's one of those beautiful counties that's rolling hills, and it's not as stark as Cornwall, and it's got lovely sort of waterways and things. So it was a very nice place to set it, I think, you know. And run it over with clotted cream. <laughs> yeah. oh, yes. Really oh. key part of Devonshire yeah. is the clotted cream. Yeah. Really serious stuff. Yeah. They do have, you've been up to Cave Creek to the little English Rose Tea Room. Yeah. Oh, yes. Well, because they do do scones yes. and clotted oh, cream. Oh, those scones are huge, aren't they? They're the biggest yes. scones in the universe. <laughs> no, they're, they're an odd sort of scone, but, they are, but the cream, the cream is good. Yeah. And the jam yeah. is really very yeah. good. If you, if you haven't experienced Real clotted cream, yeah. not not whipped cream and no, the silly they, stuff they yeah. give you. It's you, it has to be made from Jersey cows and it has mm -hmm. to be gradually heated so it, you know it almost looks like butter. Mm -hmm. I have to tell you, I took a group of friends, hiking friends, to Cornwall, yeah. and I they're all the sort of people who never eat bacon and they watch their calories and they have lots of kale and that sort of thing. <laughs> and, and I said to them, when you're here, you have to do away with any diet ideas. And they went, oh, oh no, I don't think so. So I took them and I gave them clotted cream ice cream. Oh. <laughs> and every day after that, we'd get in the car and they go, are we going to be passing an ice cream shop on the way? <laughs> <laughs> they probably went on, what is it called, the Kilo Kilo diet? What is this yeah, new yeah, diet? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Yeah. My daughter is on it and she, I spotted her putting butter in her coffee and I almost threw up. <laughs> so, I'm, you know, but obviously clotted cream would be a key ingredient oh. if oh, you were on this diet. Oh, I'd like that diet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I Devonshire. Um, there are lots of books set in Cornwall, but yes. um, relatively few in Devonshire. And recently, Annette Walters has set two books in Dorsetshire, where she uh, lives. Yeah, yeah. But they are medieval. Mm -hmm. They are oh, seriously yeah. back in yeah. a whole different war than yeah. what you're talking about. Well, of course, Sherlock Holmes' Hound of the Baskervilles is on Dartmoor right. in Devonshire. And Agatha Christie set one on Dartmoor, too. That one, that was, was it was Sitteth, Sitteth Field, Sitteth Murder, something Maybe. like that. Yeah. And of course, that's where Jamaica in, in you know, that's Cornwall, yeah. Is it in Cornwall? Yeah, that's, that's, that's sure? across the border, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there you are. All right. <laughs> I always learn something. 
<laughs> Yay. So anyway, um, your story though doesn't it starts out um, with this young woman who's not quite of age, mm -hmm. and her parents who experienced a tragic loss yeah. don't want her to do her bit for the war. No, um, her brother has volunteered and um, has been killed within the first week in the trenches. And so her parents have become uh, paranoid about losing her and keep her almost a prisoner in the house, don't want her to do anything because she's all they've got now. And at the same time, she gets this big feeling that they resent the fact that she's alive and the beloved brother is dead. So she's got this, you know, the, the feelings of not wanting to let her go and yet wishing she wasn't there, which are making her very uncomfortable. So they actually have legal power to compel her to stay at home. She's she's approaching her twenty first birthday, yeah. so yeah. that's part of the driver of the first part of the book. Yeah. But I was, you know, can they actually have prevent her? No, from they. I mean, they, they couldn't prevent her from going, but she has no money. She has nothing. I mean, okay. she on her own. She how would she survive? Um, I mean, if she went and did what her friend has done, which was sign up to be a nurse, and obviously the nurse she would get paid, and the right. nurse would take care of her, but. Um, uh, also, at the beginning of the book, I don't think she has the strength to defy her parents in that way. You know, she's come straight from school to find that her brother has been killed. And, and the parents have sort of clung to her like this. And I don't think she has the strength at the beginning of the book to say, I need to go. So her mother, performing good works, is the person who actually yeah. gives her a springboard um, yeah. to go away. So how does that work? Well, the mother goes to... Uh, there's a big house near them that has been turned into a convalescent hospital for wounded um, service people. The mother goes once a week, having baked lots of little books. Actually, the, the cook has baked the goodies, but the mother sort of pretends she has, goes around and says, oh, do have one of my little cakes, you know, and thinks she's cheering them all up. So she takes Emily with her, and Emily's horribly embarrassed to stand there while her mother gushes over them. Um, and then one day she's there, and she hears a very strange voice. And the voice says, the first thing she says is, oh, bugger. <laughs> and um, that's not the sort of thing you normally hear. And it turns out to be this tanned young man who looks very different from everybody she's known. And he's an Australian. He's an Australian pilot who was shot down. And he's recovering from quite bad burns. Well, this is where you brought your own personal living experience in Australia oh, yeah. in the play, right? Yeah. Doing that? Oh, yes. Well, it was uh, so much fun. Yeah, I mean, Australians are, um, they are, they have none of the conventions of the English. I mean, they think the English are very stuffy, and especially in those days, you know, they they say what they think, and they're very forthright, and they've got a wicked sense of humor. I lived in, I met my husband, actually, lived in Australia, so, and my parents moved to Australia and lived there for many years, so I went down every year, and now my brother still lives there, so I've got my Aussie connection. In fact, when, I, when I'm down there, you wouldn't even know the difference. <laughs> so one hopes that this is not actually a convict connection. Rather, they are there of their own free will, yeah, because yeah. as you know, was it, was it called Van Diemen's Land, or is yeah, that Tasmania? No, Van, Van, Diemen's Land, yeah, no, Van Diemen's right. Land was Tasmania, yeah. It was? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm going to go visit there yeah. a year from now, so no, I'm you? really looking I'll forward to it. I'll give you my brother's address, yeah. <laughs> no, I'm... Oh, you're Tasmania, Chris, yeah. Yeah, uh, Tasmania. not Australia. No, he's in Tasmania. Oh, yeah. okay, mm -hmm. terrific. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Um, Australia has an interesting history for those of you who haven't looked it up. And much of it originally, it was a, just like Georgia, it was a place where the English um, sent prisoners that um, they just wanted to expel, yeah. right? Well, you got sent to um, Tas you got sent to Australia for the least little thing. If you stole a loaf of bread, you'd be put on a transport ship and sent down to Australia. That was, you know, for life, pretty much. And the conditions were really hard. It's so funny because now it's become a huge status thing to have a convict in your ancestry. So everybody, everybody's invented a convict in their ancestry. But that does, that does explain their different attitude. Um, yeah. You know. And so there he is, and he's um, in poor shape, but yeah. recovering. Yeah, he's recovering. And yeah. he and Emily eventually worked out... Um, a way to meet clandestinely. Yeah. Well, uh, they, Emily wants to join up. Her, her friend is a nurse, and so she goes to she goes to see if she could like, maybe be a nurse because her mother, the interfering mother, 
has found out about him and had him shipped to another hospital and put further away. <laughs> so Emily thinks, well, perhaps I could be a nurse there. And it turns out they don't need any more nurses because it's towards the end of the war. Um, and the recruiting officer says what they do need is women to work on the land. England is literally about to starve because a whole generation of young men is not coming back to work in the farms. Um, and so they formed a women's land army and they're recruiting women from all walks of life to literally come and learn how to be farmhands. And so Emily signs up. Her parents are horrified there. She says, she's just turned 21 now. You can't stop me, she says. So off she goes. She does. And now she has both a job of doing her bit and a source of income. How much farther do we want to go? I mean, there's a lot of this book revealed yeah. in the very opening part, but yeah. I don't know if you want to take a I think we sh Well, I think that... Um, the story we will keep we will keep there because otherwise you'll think oh we don't need to buy this book we know what's going on. <laughs> but we um, have a better system they already have bought the book so <laughs> I'm not too concerned but, but no the thing that's interesting is there was a twofold um, reason for writing this book one of it was wanting to deal with World War One the other was that I at a used bookstore I found this book on herbal remedies and. Um, some of them went back to the 1600s, and they were for things as serious like as heart complaints, and you know some were hand creams, but some were sort of headaches, heart complaints, and things. So I was rather fascinated by those, and I thought, what if somebody found that they inherited a house that was surrounded by a healing garden? And wouldn't that be an interesting thing in a book? And that whole concept of healing yourself through healing other people. And so um, Emily goes to a cottage where the herbal garden is around it. So that was kind of an interesting part of the book. And, you know, what can you do with herbs? You can heal. Well, I heard Land Girl Service turns into yeah. gardening for this yeah, estate. And there is, yeah. there is this wonderful garden. Now, there was a time when people who were actually doing that sort of thing might well have been accused of witchcraft, right? But that could well have been, yes. <laughs> well, we'll say no, more. no, it absolutely did. I mean, in those days, especially in the countryside, as they say in the book, you know, if if you are treating someone and they die, you've poisoned them or you've killed them. I mean, not the fact that you were trying to help them and they were going to die anyway, or even if you, you're known to be the wise woman and someone's cow dies, you're a witch. And um, yeah. the, you know, the worst thing they 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 used to do the ducking stool, which was. Um, you know, they sit you in this stool and duck you down, and and if you, um, it, yeah. I forget which way it was, but if you if you if you died, you were innocent. But <laughs> <laughs> if you if didn't you die, if you up, didn't you die, away. then they then they'd burn you at the stake. You know, so. it was a no win all the way, no win, yes. all the way around. But yeah. I mean, a lot of it was that you know there were medical practitioners were relatively thin on the ground and yeah. didn't necessarily have much in the way of treatment options and so forth. So people who knew about herbs and could actually help um, were often... Well, actually, a lot of the old herbal remedies have been adapted to our modern drugs. You know? I mean, they, they, use, they certainly use things like willow bark long before they are found it. Fever view, all, yeah, those, kinds view, all those things. Yeah. And they're finding, interestingly enough, they're finding things, you know, the Arctic is fine, and um, there's more access to bacteria. Same with the Amazon as the rainforest is coming down. They're finding opportunities, you know, for creating drugs and so forth um, from the things that um, are coming forth. So there may be some additional changes in medicine. Um, but anyway, you can imagine that, you know, way back, if, if somebody achieved what looked like a miracle, that would be suspicious. If you treated a woman in childbirth and she died or the baby died, you know, that could go against yeah, you. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Donna, she right, and you know, you're in the early 20th century, yeah. but would that have been a factor, you know, for Ella Fair and her family well, in yeah, Oklahoma? I was just telling Reese that I did, that one of my books uh, was set during the uh, flu epidemic of 1918. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was before antibiotics. And mm -hmm. so I did a lot of research on how they, the home remedies and the herbs yeah. and things that they used uh, to try and save people from the yeah. flu. Yeah, at the time. yeah this, this comes up in the story too because uh, towards you know, the end of the war is when just when people are breathing a sigh of relief and the, the soldiers are coming home. And of course, the soldiers are coming home and they're bringing the flu with them. And, um, and then this really hits when people are um, 
haven't had very good rations and they've been very stressed and everything and, and so it just literally it sweeps across Europe and it sweeps across America. What what did it kill? I think it killed between fifty and a hundred million people. So more people than died in the war. Yeah, many more people died in the war. Um, and it was I mean it was a hugely global thing. Yeah. Anna wrote one of her best Kate Shugag books about a native village in um, Alaska that was just decimated yeah. by uh, by the flu. You know, I was thinking, I mentioned Manette in her book set in Dorsetshire. Um, it, it, it is hard if you're writing historical fiction not to bring modern stuff into it, but, but there was an epidemic, it was the bubonic plague, yeah. that's what happened. Yeah. And um, without really understanding the basic sanitation and other quarantine, they, this um, estate was behind a moat. Mm -hmm. And so they were remodeling or something, and so they dug the moat way deeper. And then they figured if they could just keep everybody on the other side of the moat, people that were inside mm -hmm. would not get the plague. And mm -hmm. lo, it was true. But uh, they didn't understand the mechanism of it. So it's interesting yeah. as a modern reader to read about that. And you know you yeah. know why it worked, but they don't well, know. Well, if you remember, with, if you saw last last week's episode of Victoria right. on television, right. that, that they thought that um, it was it was uh, the the miasma, the bad air that was causing cholera, not realizing that it was the water system that was poisoned. Yeah, it was one deadly fountain somewhere in London, yeah, right? Which yeah, they yeah. finally yeah yeah. So, um, what did you do yourself? Did you um, bone up on herbal lore? Or I, I did. Yeah, I, I I had this this book to start with, which was really interesting with the in the you know, the fifteenth sixteenth century ones, and I had those, and then I had a couple of other books. So. Everything that I was writing, I had, first of all, I had to make sure that it would grow in England at that time of year, or else one could use the root, or else she'd recognise what it was. You know, I mean, she's not an expert. She's not. She's not going to say, "Oh, I think I'll go and pick a little fever few because she probably doesn't know what it looks like." Um, but she does know what things like uh, lavender and rosemary and, and those sort of things look like. And so I, you know, I, I did a lot of studying up, and I had to think honestly, what could she do and what couldn't she do. Um, but that, you know, that's kind of fun to do. And we took the train down from London to Cornwall, and of course it goes right over that river, um, which is the Tamar, which divides Devon and Cornwall out of Plymouth. And it's the railway bridge was it was built in that time, so we went over, you know, went over the bridge and everything. It was kind of fun. Yes. Well, you can. You're not that far back in time in England. No, there are no. things that go way further back. Oh yeah. I mean, that that's modern in England. You know. <laughs> in fact, when we were in Italy once, we were in a village called Toro, which is on Lake Trasimeno. If you read the guidebooks, it says there is nothing of particular interest or activity or antiquity in this village. The, the first details were not till the 1400s. <laughs> this is a very modern village. <laughs> So the other thing is a reader that you will be aware of, um, and without speaking about how the book comes out, but you do know that you know whoever survives in this book and gets on with their life, that the next war is coming. So yeah. I think it makes it you know particularly poignant. When you write about World War II when it's over, you know it's kind of like it's over, right? Um, unless you're sent off to Korea or something. But in the, I think the real tragedy of, of reading about Europe in World War One and any of its theaters is that you know that no matter how well they survive the first war, they're just going to get clobbered yeah. all over again. Yeah, and if they're having a child now, that child's going to be exactly the right age for the next war. So, yes. you know. And one of the things I dealt with in the book is, I think this is a huge step forward in women's liberation, because women had to take roles they really didn't think they were capable of. You know, you take these these women in the land army. The uniform was bloomers, and a jacket and big boots. They threw away their corsets. They cut their hair. They and they were you know they were working in the fields. They were digging potatoes. They were manipulating a great big plow. They were, some of them learned forestry and with great big saws and things. They were doing things that they would not have believed they were capable of. And so I thought to myself, if you have a village and the blacksmith's not coming home, and the pub owner's not coming home. You know, who does this? And it would have to be the women, or else, you know, how do they survive? So I think after this, you'll find that um, women's suffrage took a big leap forward. I think, you know, I think in England it was 1920 when women, or some women, were given the vote. And I think that was because they said, well, you know, look how well they did in, in the war. Well, and it was fortunate that many of them actually earned some kind of um, 
profession or at least a way to make a living because so many of the men died. Yeah. We're talking not only did younger women not have men to marry because there weren't enough, but there were so many widows who yeah. weren't going to have anybody to support them. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. this is all back to Downton, those of you who went through, you know, yeah. various, the house, um, High Clare Castle, as it all turns out, which you can now go visit as a, as a tour, um, but it's the kind of house that Reese is talking about, which was turned into a hospital and, um, you know, brought in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's a fairly familiar thing for TV yeah. viewers to, yeah, yeah see yeah. all that. Yeah, and of course, Lavinia dies, <laughs> conveniently. <laughs> What's his name should have died then and not in that ridiculous car accident. It was possibly the worst episode of television ever. Well, the worst thing was you knew because you'd read ahead that he was going to die. So through the whole thing, every time you picked up a gun, it was like, put that gun down. Chose <laughs> <Right. laughs> the automobile instead. Yeah, right. yeah. But actually, if you were a woman of marriageable age at that time, your chances of marriage were one in ten. No, it, was, it was truly horrendous because the whole generation of eligible men for women of that age were the people who were fighting, you know. So mm -hmm. the older older people um, in their 40s and all had probably different kinds of jobs and so yeah. forth. So. Although the, the age to be called up by the end of the war was 40. Was it? Yeah, really? so you know, there were people who were, had you know, wives, families, professions, and they were called up to go and... The, I mean, those trenches, I went to an exhibit at the um, Imperial War Museum in London, and they re recreated a trench. And it was taller than this room, and quite narrow. And of course, the, the mud sometimes was so deep that men actually drowned in the mud. Oh, Can you imagine living in those conditions? There were yeah. rats in those yeah. trenches, and you had the constant shelling above you. And I mean, no wonder the men who came home came home so wounded in both body and mind because of these hot, if you imagine, it's so close to England too, you'd be sent home on leave and you'd go home to um, Surrey or Kent and you'd sit there and your mother would say, oh, do you have some strawberries and cream? And then a week later you'd be sent back to this hell. It no, it's no wonder so many minds snapped. Yeah. Well, and shell shock was not recognized as um, disorder, but you know, it was basically treated as cowardice, so yeah. it made it even more yeah. difficult. Uh, you, last week, um, Charles Todd, or Caroline, was here, and yeah. you know that—that's the whole premise behind the Rutledge series: is that he—he um, he is suffering from shell shock because he had to shoot someone for cowardice. Right. One of one of the really good things of Black Ascot, the book that she was here to sign last Friday, is that Rutledge, who has this voice, is a symptom of of or he had to he had to shoot a, a young man for not following orders, and so that voice has stuck in his head. Um, but he goes to a hospital, such as the one you're talking mm -hmm. about for the burn victims, yeah. as part of his investigation, and all of a sudden he's confronted with all these men like him. Um, and so it's almost like a selfie, you know, or, or looking in a mirror for, for Rutledge, mm -hmm. yeah. which is, um, you know, on the other hand, one of the, one of the interesting things that came out of all this, because um, of the snipers and the way that um, guns were fired and so forth, is there a huge number of men who lost half their face or worse, you know, from injury. This is when plastic surgery started. Mm -hmm. It was a way, in the Civil War, what they did, I wish I could remember, there's a really good crime novel about this. In the Civil War, what they would do is they would try to make metal masks mm -hmm. to fit over these people's yeah. faces so they wouldn't terrify people, you know, and, or they wouldn't be rejected and ashamed at all. But in, in World War I, they began to think that that wasn't really the solution. And so, you know, they began what has become, you know, plastic surgery today, but it was essentially started for yeah. trying to deal with these terrible things. Losing your face, I mean, you could lose a lot of different things. I was just reading Jackie Winsbury's book that she'll be here to sign at the end of March, and oh, one of um, Priscilla's sons has lost an arm, and he's just giving everybody all this grief about it and how terrible it is in the whole bit. They say they take him to a hospital where there are all these men who've lost their faces. And he recognizes that losing an arm is not nearly the, it's not a loss of identity, yeah. like losing your face. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing in World War One was dealing with um, gas attacks, mustard gas. Mm -hmm. There were men who came home, but their lungs were so shot that they were suffering, you know, a long, slow death, actually. They were drowning. 
Well, and you talked about Australia. Well, this book doesn't take us to Australia. Um, the Anzac soldiers, the Australia yeah. and New Zealand forces that were decimated at Gallipoli. Yeah. You've yeah. talked to me about that, yeah. that you can find like a monument yeah. in every marketplace. Yeah. yeah, you go to any little town in Australia and there's a big monument to World War One, and it's to our brave boys and it's a tiny town. And you see, you know, Peter Jones, Fred Jones, like four people from one family. And they volunteered in incredible numbers wanting to do their bit for the mother for the motherland. And um, of course in Gallipoli they were just slaughtered on the beach there. They were sent onto this beach where the Turks manned all the heights and they were literally mown down in huge numbers. Very true. Yeah, you know, I had a surreal experience um, going to Turkey years ago with Rob and we went to Gallipoli. And for Gallipoli, it's basically Valley Forge for the Turks. This is where they won this battle. And Kemal Atatürk becomes the George Washington of Turkey because he repelled this invasion. And it's really the birthplace of modern Turkey, the end of the Ottoman Empire. So from their standpoint, Gallipoli was yeah. a glorious victory. Yeah. And from our standpoint, it was a hideous yeah. disaster. Yeah. So, you know, it, travel is a really good thing in the sense that it does show you other points of view, yeah. you know, and, and other things. Yeah, the first people. time we were in India, um, we were talk, told about the first war of independence. And we were like, oh, you mean the mutiny? <laughs> <laughs> 1857. Right, right. right. Well, anyway, this book is not <coughs> as depressing as this conversation. So <laughs> let's go. Um, it, it's it's a very hopeful book, and there there are a number of good things that um, that come out of it. I think it's important to remember when you read it how difficult travel was, and so you know if you have people in Australia engaging with people in England, um, it wasn't. It wasn't like a jet away. It wasn't like, you know, you could call them on your phone or do FaceTime or Skype or something. It was an incredible gulf. Yeah, I've always thought that because we had several family members who went to Australia in the early part of the 20th century. And what would happen is you'd write a letter and it would take, say, three months to get to England. And so there you are in England thinking that they're wonderful and having a lovely life. And in fact, three months ago, they died. You don't oh. hear it three months because it takes that long for the letter to get there so um you know that's it, it really was the ends of the earth in those days yeah absolutely yeah. So I think we probably yeah, said I all that we, we want to say yeah. about yeah. the book. Yeah. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions you Absolutely so. Yeah. So any of your questions? Yes. Tell us about your Welsh background from writing Constable Evans. Oh my, yeah. Uh, yeah. For, I, I can't tell you, almost every day still I get at least one email saying, when is there going to be another Constable Evans yes. book? Yeah, my, my mother's family comes from Wales and um, uh, uh, when I was a child, I was taken to Wales every summer by my aunt Gladys with a, a W. Um, and um, I'd stay with elderly great aunts there in, in, in a town that's very like Llanfair in my books. And um, as a child, I thought it was all very normal. You know, you take, take everything for granted. Of course, most people, Welsh was their primary language. My great aunt would say in Welsh, it's time to go and wash your hands. And I'd just go, you know. Um, and... Um, but the, it was it was an interesting little town. There were various things. They really did have people who had nicknames like Evans the Meat and Evans the Milk and Evans the Post. And um, there were a couple of you know that was very very typical of Wales in those days. It's lost pretty much now. But um, uh, there, were, there were some famous ones like there was a travel agent called Evans there and back. <laughs> and then in the same town there was an undertaker called Evans One Way. <laughs> they had their wicked sense of humour. And also in this little town there was something I put in my Evan books, which was the two um, Methodist chapels who were always at war. Right. They literally would. It took us a while, you know, my aunt and I would say, wait a minute. They would they would go one would go to his Bible and put up some quote from the Bible. The other would rush to his Bible and find something that completely refuted it or one upped it. Um, and you know, my aunt and I go, wait a minute, that one says, and this one over here says. Um, and so clearly they, it was a war that was going on in a polite way for a long time. And um, you know, there was one in the first book that says, repent ye for you know not when the end may come. Judgment day is tomorrow. <laughs> so, um, you know, so it was really fun to write about that and to all those things that, that I'd remembered that were so quintessentially Welsh. So um, my aunt was a very keen hiker. I'd been taken up Mount Snowdon by every single route. Um, so, you know, I put all that in the books. We should mention that in your series, Memory yeah. 3, 
um, that there's always been a romance undercurrent, right? In mm -hmm. all of them, Evans, of course, you know, I yeah. can't think of her name at the moment. Yeah. And then Molly eventually gets yeah. married, and yeah. you know, Lady Georgie is on that track yeah. and whatever. And so, you know, as a as a writer of crime fiction, you arrive at a point where if you've given somebody a family and children and you know all the rest of it, they're going off sleuthing in a dangerous devil may care way becomes less credible. Yeah. So well, you've kind of that, written your way through. That's the problem two. with yeah, problem with Molly especially is that Molly I'm up to I've done book seventeen in Molly and she's married and she has a child. And then you have to ask yourself, if I was responsible for another person, when would I put my life in jeopardy? And so for the books I've done since she had the first child, then I have to say, um, it has to be a really credible thing. What would make me, in this case, get involved in that? Well, that's true. Plus, you have to allow for child care as well. You can't just yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. lock the child in a crib and, oh, and no, take I mean, off. The one I set in Paris was an absolute nightmare yes. because every time she was going out, I think, wait, who's going to look after the baby? And, then, <laughs> and she was still nursing at that stage, so she's got to rush back. You know, it got really, really. But why did I let her have this child? That was a stupid thing to do. <laughs> She was young and they were Catholic and, and yeah. birth control wasn't all that great. And so there, there she is. But I mean, Evan too goes through yeah. this long courtship and yeah. then, you know, at some point. Well, you get to a stage, if you do enough books, you can't have the will they, won't they going on ad nauseum. It gets really annoying, you know. Mm -hmm. No, I, so I think that, had to I, marry them all off eventually. <laughs> yeah, right. That's right. why standalones are so great. You can leave them in suspense and go somewhere else. <laughs> you can kill them at random or, you know, leave them to their fate. Um, and there are a lot of, I mean, one of the things I think that's really interesting about standalones is that you don't really want to know what happens when they get to that stage in the yeah. book, right? You want to, you don't want to know what happened when um, Scarlet goes back to Terra. You know, that's for the reader to imagine. Um, so I, I do think there's a lot of a lot of freedom, yeah. and it's a little scary for the reader because you don't have any guarantee that everybody will survive. Yeah. You know, the person who's narrating the book to you that you might really love could very well not make it through the end of the book. Oh, well, that's a temptation for my next book. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it, it is yeah. a different a different experience. Yeah. So another question. This is a content audience, isn't it? Yeah. You've had too much wine. Yeah. Yeah. What, what was the name of the herbal that you found? The um, it was called, I think it was called Herbal Remedies, Recipes and Remedies, I think it was called. Um, 16th century? Ago? Well, some of them. What, what it had was um, a modern version <laughs> of, of something, and then it would have um, a little snippet of something that, that, that was the first one they found, which was from like. When, when I come back next time, I'll bring the book and then I'll show it to you. But it, it's beautifully done. It was all illustrated and everything. Just to look at it by itself was a lot of fun. And it had lots of things like, you know, various teas <laughs> and hand creams and things that, you know, were very tempting to, to try. So recently back in August for the Lady Georgie book, and so oh, that'll yeah, be a time. Yeah, we don't yeah. have a date yet, but somewhere around August 6th. Yeah. Um, yeah. You can, yeah, we can look at the book. Actually, I was thinking about it when James Rollinson was here um, early in January. His book, Crucible, involves the Sp witchcraft and the Spanish Inquisition, which at first put them to death, but then actually became their defenders. But there was a book called the Malleus Maleficorum, I think it is, which was like a handbook for witches. Mm -hmm. And um, so Reese is writing a really benign version yeah. of, of, of how that worked out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know me, I'm, I'm quite benign in what I do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, and my, when I did my first few books, I got reviews and it said, this delightful mystery, this this delightful and charming mystery, this charm. And I got rather annoyed because, you know, nobody takes you seriously, you know, unless you write very noir. So I said to my editor, my next book is going to contain cannibalism, satanism, <laughs> and strewn body parts. And she said, and I bet they'll be very charming and delightful body parts. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't written that one yet. Where is it? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, perhaps that's, that's written in a drawer somewhere. Oh, okay. No, the thing is, I can't, I cannot write, there's certain things I cannot write. I cannot murder a child. I'm, there was one book, well, Evans Gate, which actually yeah. was nominated for the Edgar. Yeah. A child does die in it, and I had planned that that ch child was murdered, etc. I couldn't do it. 
you know, a child dies, but it's not murder. I just couldn't do the murder. You know, there's certain things you can't do. Well, you have your own, you yeah. know, your own codes, so you to speak, yeah. like the code yeah. of the West or yeah. whatever, the code of yeah. the writer. Um, and you, you know, you have yeah, to stick to it. The thing that's so amusing is that um, you could do horrible things to children and old people. If you do anything to an animal, you're doomed. Oh. <laughs> I actually, in one of the Evans, Evans books, it was the story was about the um, foot and mouth epidemic in Wales, which was actually happening when I was writing the book. And they just got orders to slaughter whole herds of sheep. And what they'd do is, my friend who lived there said you'd think it would, they'd pile up the corpses and then they'd burn them. And she said you'd think it would smell like lamb cooking. And instead of that, it smelled this horrible, like, bone and fur burning and you never got that smell out of your nostrils so I put it in the book and I got this I got this message from a woman who said now you've started killing animals I will never read one of your books again <laughs> like, it's a sheep you eat them you know yeah. <laughs> Well, and it was also happening in real life. You yeah, didn't yeah, yeah. It up. No, 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 Unfortunately, there is no way to contain hoof and mouth disease except for killing off the animals. Yeah, yeah. It's one of those one of those things where you'd like to think yeah. that one of these weird bacteria rising up out of yeah. the Arctic or something yeah. might actually give you yeah. something. Anybody yeah. else? Yes. Is there a victory garden in the victory garden? I mean, a World War II, uh, not no. definitely well, victory gardens in World War II. Yeah, but this. The whole book is about gardens, actually, and that's the theme of the book. It is is and, and actually, she takes over a garden and brings it back to life. Um, so in that way, it, it's her victory garden. It's not what we. I mean, she does. She grows vegetables for the house, etc. And um, and it, it was only towards the end of World War One that they started encouraging people to do this because it wasn't like World War Two where you had to uh, every ship that tried to come in was being sunk. You know, so everybody, uh, it was towards the end of the war when, mainly when men were not coming back to work the fields, that you realized that people had to grow their own food. And so it wasn't like World War II where they recommended from the very beginning that you started growing your own food. Yeah, there's a, a really serious blockade and yeah. much of supplies. Have you ever read, Robert Harris wrote a really wonderful book about Leslie Park and so forth. I can't remember oh, the name. Enigma. Called? Enigma. Yeah, Thank you. Which might one of my favorite Robert books, Harris yeah. books. Yeah. And the thing you come away from Enigma with is not just the code cracking and all the rest of it, but the, the grayness of life and the fact there wasn't any soap. So people not only had grungy clothes, you know, but they were grungy. Yeah. And people never really felt clean, um, you know, and you had to get used to smells and all kinds. Of, it was very medieval in that sense, you know, before there was much in the way of personal hygiene. and. So it was a, uh, it was an, an awful time. Yeah, I mean everything was rationed. So you know, you, and even if you had the rations, sometimes you'd go into the into the stores and there wouldn't be anything on the shelves. So you had to. That's why you know for tonight we've got some very nice shortbread and things because <laughs> when I thought you know okay I'm writing about a country that's starving. What what can I bring that's that's sort of a theme of that? And I thought well you know I can't make a a potato and rutabaga pie you know <laughs> which is what they made. I but could. It would probably just sit over there. <laughs> you could have made it and shellacked it. Yeah. Yeah. Sort of kept yeah. it. It was yeah. there. We could yeah. have given away a surprise or something. Yeah. Anybody over here have a question? I've sort of got my back to you. Yeah. Come on, people. Wait. Yes. No. I just have something to say about verbs. Yes. And, um, we were in um, Alaska about maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and we went to a small village where there was a hospital. Yeah. And in the village, the chief of medicine was office was here and over here was the medicine man's office and all the Alaskans told the people we met in this village told us the doctors would give them the prescriptions they would throw them away they would go to the medicine man and he'd tell them what to get in the tundra and they took us out to the tundra yeah. to see and yeah. show us and I'm like this is like modern times yeah. you know it's yeah. not yeah. so even now you know people yeah. you know in that area that yeah. the uh but they rely on their uh, medicine man. Yeah. Well, yeah. but alas, as the tundra is warming up, I the know. things that yeah. the medicine man was recommending, yeah. you know, yeah. may not this be. This was about 20 years ago. Yeah. So. Effective anymore. So, um, this is a good moment when we might say goodbye to our video audience oh, yeah. and thank, thank everybody for joining. For those of you who would like, you can go to the Poison Pen Facebook page and share the video. Just 